Walt Disney was a busy fellow and 1966 proved to be another active year on his expanding calendar. Many things were brewing within the Walt Disney Company and as per the usual, Walt would have a significant hand in each of them. Walt, the leader of the Walt Disney Studios, was guiding the production and development of its 19th animated feature film, The Jungle Book. It would be released to audiences in the following year. Walt was also happily producing The Happiest Millionaire, a musical adapted from a play adapted from a novel called My Philadelphia Father. It would be released to audiences in the following year. While Walt was also overseeing the transition of his popular World's Fair attractions from their temporary New York stage to their permanent Disneyland residence, he was also shepherding the brand new attractions that were soon to be entering into the park. Huge expansions in Disneyland would open this year, and even more attractions were on the impending horizon. The Disneyland Park, just as Walt had always intended it, was a constantly morphing, changing, and transformingly magical and wondrous environment. These objectives would prove ever true in the following months and years, as Disneyland would say so long to a handful of attractions and welcome several new ones. And Walt as well was in the process of developing a special skiing resort in what is now Sequoia National Park called Mineral King. Walt had visited the area recreationally many times before and had been extremely keen in developing something within that type of wintry environment ever since he had been placed in charge of producing the opening and closing ceremonies for the 1960 Winter Olympics in Squaw Valley, California. In 1965, the Sierra Nevada land that housed the ideal vacation destination became available for potential resort development by the Forest Service. Of the several that offered varying designs, Walt made the winning proposal and was given the green light to explore and expand his idea for a Disney resort there. With Walt at the helm, production on this project was moving swiftly. And Walt as well for several years had been contributing to the merging of two art schools, the Chouinard Art Institute and the Los Angeles Conservatory of Music, into a brand new program and school he was founding called the California Institute of the Arts. At Cal Arts, these artists would be taught by professionals in the form and would be able to establish their forte and artful identity. In the future, many of the big players in Disney animation and beyond would find their igniting beginnings within the halls of Cal Arts. Walt soon hoped to complete this merger by having one single campus that could house and champion the creativity learning there. A project so vast, it has already been called a whole new Disney world. And now, here is Walt Disney. Walt was undertaking and overseeing many different tasks and ventures, but none of which could overtake Walt's involvement in his latest enterprise. Walt was no longer satisfied with shaping American culture and the way it loved to be entertained through media and amusement parks. He wanted to go further and shape and perfect the way America could and would live in the world of the future. Walt had recently just purchased a sizable area of land in Central Florida. The proclaiming press conference ensured that Orlando would soon be home to a brand new East Coast Disneyland. But what wasn't quite mentioned during the broadcast was the driving force behind the entire purchase. That force was EPCOT, an acronym standing for the Experimental Prototype Community of Tomorrow. What Walt dreamed would be a living blueprint of the future. Epcot was going to be a functioning city, a multi-level community that would revolutionize industry, transportation, modern living, recreation, and more. Walt saw the problems facing the modern city, and Epcot proposed a special solution to each of them. It was to be the progress city, the first original of what could potentially be commonplace around the world. Walt on screen stood there proudly, showcasing what would be the ultimate pinnacle of his storied career. Epcot, if truly completed, was knocking on the door of being one of the most forward moments in human history. Yes, there were a wealth of big things on the horizon for Disneyland and the Walt Disney Organization especially. Walt's plate was certainly full, but his appetite for progress could certainly handle the task. His life had been full of this incredible ambition. Along his journey, he had been faced with several hurdles. Some were harder to get over, and Walt ended up bloodied on the ground many times before. But with each stumble he learned, and with each failure, he grew. These falls and defeats inspired his rise and successes, and those hurdles, slowly but surely, throughout his career, were becoming easier to jump over. Epcot was a race to the broadening future, and Walt was determined to split the ribbon at that visionary finish line. And it was as if nothing could slow him down. But there were other players in that race, and in 1966, those players would finally catch up to him. Well, if I had it to do over again, uh, I think, uh, no, I don't think it would. <laughs> I don't know. I hope I don't have to do it over again. <laughs> Walt 
One night, Walt was casually touring the studio, as he often did, and began chatting with Mark Davis in his workspace. Mark gladly updated Walt on the developing Pirates attraction, going over models and discussing concepts that he was a part of. While Mark had Walt, he began showing him some humorous concept work he had drawn for another attraction. He presented Walt with a picture of a band of country music singing bears. It was planned for an entertaining animatronic show to be featured as an accent in one of the restaurants being designed for Mineral King. Walt was amused. He loved it and unrushed, chuckled with Mark as he showed him more gags that he had created. He stayed as long as Mark could keep him. Mark Davis, while loving the one-on-one -on -one time with the boss, could tell something was unusual with Walt. The savoring way he was carrying himself and the conversation, something was off. At the end of their long exchange, Walt stood in the doorway, preparing to leave. Walt looked back towards his creative imagineer. Goodbye, Mark, he said. Which immediately struck Mark as strange, because historically, Walt was always one to say, See you later. This would be the last time Mark and Walt spoke together. No one really knew the severity of Walt's condition, especially Walt himself. As far as the studio was aware, Walt would be gone just a few days. The explanation's simple, just minor neck surgery for an old polo injury that had been bothering him for years. But the truth would lead back far beyond then. Walt began smoking cigarettes unfiltered as a young driver for the Red Cross during World War I. Chesterfields were Walt's brand of choice, and he would smoke three packs a day, every day, for the rest of his life. Walt had developed lung cancer, and with it a tumor the size of a walnut. His visit to Providence St. Joseph Medical Center in November of 1966 had not been for any lasting polo injury, but for the partial removal of one of his lungs. The operation was deemed mostly successful, and after two weeks, Walt was sent home to recuperate and enjoy the Thanksgiving holiday with his family. It seemed like things were going to be okay, but once Thanksgiving had passed, Walt's condition worsened, and he found himself on December 5th, celebrating his 65th birthday back in the hospital. Walt, over the next several days, would be going in and out of consciousness. The cancer was taking its toll. He had rapidly lost weight, his face had become pale and gaunt, and he frequently groaned that his feet were cold. Walt only allowed his close family in the room with him. He didn't want anybody to remember him this way. No one at the studio was aware of any of this. Walt's big brother Roy was always there. He stood at the edge of the hospital bed, gently rubbing Walt's feet, making sure his kid brother would stay as comfortable as he could. St. Joseph Medical Center was just across the street from the Disney Studios. Roy had ordered that the studio keep the lights on overnight so that Walt could easily see the buildings from his bed. In his final conversation with his brother, Walt was steady with excitement as he vividly envisioned the layout of the entire Florida project against the tiles of the ceiling above his bed. Walt had so much left to do. At 9.30 a.m. on December 15th, the cancer took its final blow as his heart quietly stopped and Walt Disney passed on into the ages. He was 65 years old. A nation was in mourning, and a world collectively wept over the loss of history's most fantastic and creative genius. A small service was held the next day for his immediate family at the Little Church of the Flowers at Forest Lawn Cemetery in Glendale, California. He was cremated a day later and interred permanently in the Freedom Mausoleum. According to his wishes, these ceremonies were extremely private and were announced to the public after they had taken place. In 1956, Diane Disney wrote of her father, 
He never goes to a funeral if he can help it. If he had to go to one, it plunges him into a reverie which lasts for hours after he's home. At such times, he says, When I'm dead, I don't want a funeral. I want people to remember me alive. What a sentiment. And also, what a reality. Walt left behind his wife, Lily, and his two daughters, Diane and Sharon, his grandchildren and siblings and in-laws, as well as a flourishing company and ideology that had colored the world with a capacity to dream. One would be hard-pressed to find themselves unaffected by Walt and his influences. Walt would live on through a lasting legacy and the powerful impact he had had on the culture, through a catalog of drawings, shorts, television programs and movies, and most grandly, a whole park that could and would spiritually retell a story. Disneyland, when condensed down to its core main themes, is arguably the best living and breathing reflection of the man Walt Disney. Your first introduction to Disneyland was mirrored after Walt's first introductions to America, a reflection of Walt's boyhood and his American town, filled with pleasant memories of a bygone past. But this Main Street is at a crossroads, a Main Street in motion, a Main Street on the move. Different eras collide on this thoroughfare, modes of transportation are advancing, new technologies are emerging as we walk down the middle. This was progress and Walt couldn't just sit still. And while Walt loved his hometown, America, he had to get out and explore. He had to get out and change the world. This was the blank yet increasingly detailed canvas where Walt would begin his storied adventure. Main Street was a representation of Walt's longing and blossoming patriotism and his love for country and nostalgia. Main Street USA is Walt. It was Walt's spirit of adventure, his thirst to shift the ordinary, a feeling that put him on a train from Kansas City to Los Angeles, where he would continue to take massive leaps into the unfamiliar in an effort to entertain the world. This hunger would send Walt around the globe, finding goodwill and amity in other cultures, peoples, and places. Walt was an ambassador of experience. Adventureland was a representation of Walt's courage and his willingness to explore the unknown to achieve his dreams, no matter the consequences. Adventureland is Walt. Frontier, by definition, means the discovery of the farthest most limits of knowledge and achievement. It may not have been within the limits of tract and territory like the era that Frontierland itself pays homage to, but surely Walt was a frontiersman in his own right, in the areas of American entertainment and technology. Walt saw a monochrome tree and said, hey, let's give it color. He saw a fairy tale and said, let's make it longer. He saw his girls on a merry-go-round and said, let's make a place. Walt saw a mechanical bird in a cage and said, let's give them a show. Frontierland was a representation of Walt's adoration for discovery and his ceaseless desire to push the boundaries of innovation in whatever path that was before him. Frontierland is Walt. Where would any of this be without Walt's dreams, that creativity that brought a mouse to life, a princess to song, and a castle to California? The beauty of Fantasyland is that the fantastical things there are no longer make-believe. They have been pulled from our daydreams and are actively before us in a physical form. Imagination is the sixth sense as fantasy becomes real and Walt's story of inspiration safeguards the wish that our wildest ambitions are never out of reach. Fantasyland was a representation of Walt's imagination and his special brand of creativity that made make-believe genuine. Fantasyland is Walt. Walt pined for the nostalgia of the life lived before him. He carried his heart safely in a wistful appreciation for the days of past, but he had his mind fully in the world of the future. Walt lived for today, fondly remembered yesterday, and dreamed of an incredible future formed by the collective of humanity and the potential of all its collaborative achievements. A progress city where technology and design made living together in unity the easiest, if not the only, option. Tomorrowland was a representation of Walt's hopeful optimism and his love for emerging technology and his visions of a hopeful and united world. Tomorrowland is Walt. Walt was regularly quoted as saying it was all started by a mouse. All of it, the films, the park, the memories, all trace back to one Mickey Mouse. It was started by a mouse, he'd say. This is an opinion that can be greatly challenged. The matter was, it was all started by a man. A man with a dream, a man with countless dreams, a man with a drive to pull them from figments and make them so. Walt Disney was the ultimate dreamer, from his hard beginnings in middle America to his ending days as the amicable uncle of the world. He lived with one goal. He sought to bring joy to everyone by doing the things he loved. 
He was an example of passion. It was never easy for him. Along with his successes, he had equal failures. But they never kept him down. There was never any before, and there would never be again, another like Walt Disney. In the subsequent months, there was a massive change amidst the company. Without its creator to champion it, Walt's unique vision of the community of the future was tabled. Some aspects of the ski resort Mineral King fell through, and it was canceled. Disney animation would stagnate for a bit as they attempted to find their new legs and create new stories without their imaginative shepherd. But Disneyland, what was Disneyland going to do? Disneyland had to keep going. On December 16th, 1966, the day after Walt's time with us was up, Disneyland opened at 9 a.m., just as it had the day before, and just as it would every day after for the foreseeable future. And Walt would be there.